I'll talk a little bit about the drugs, but you've heard so much about them and from much brighter people than me, I think. Um, I'm going to just touch on where I think they will alter things. I thought I'd broaden it out, throw out some interesting new studies that have come out that I think we should be thinking about in terms of how to make delivery of care easier and faster and smarter and cheaper in resource poor countries and some of the things I've been thinking about over the last few months. So um, there's a whole lot of people who helped me. I took their names out and just added their organizations because I'm scared I've forgotten somebody um, who helped me with the presentation. Um, so in terms of dis disclosures, I'm part of a um, loose band of, of rogue clinicians and researchers and activists and drug company people and generic pharmaceutical manufacturers who are part of this kind of optimized idea, which is where you take um, systems of delivery of care, including the drugs, and you optimize the delivery and the doses and the drugs and all the rest of it. Um, and it's been an amazing experience working with people on this. And I'll show you some of the studies that will be coming out of this collaboration. I'm sure there are many others I'm not aware of. Um, also, just in terms of um, many of these studies are supported by the pharmaceutical industry, and I have a um, consulting relationship with one of the managed care organizations in South Africa. I'm part of this group called the Optimize Group, which is a UNITAID and USID supported group looking at some fairly high risk um, drug um, studies, which hopefully will give us cheaper and smarter regimens. So what makes resource poor areas challenging for those of you who don't work there and those of you who do work there, just to remind you, is firstly is it's obviously less resourced. And the problem about it is there's often less advocacy um, within, um, within these, these, these um, environments. So there's not people fighting on your behalf. The patients don't march and burn things. They, the healthcare workers are often like so isolated they don't mobilize as well. Um, so there's often less focus on, on people. So in rural Canada, for instance, you'll get exactly the same things that you get in, in rural South Africa in terms of advocacy. There's often, and those of us who particularly work in Africa know about this, inconsistent electricity and water. And electricity can be disastrous because it often funnels other things that you need. There's also um, inconsistent supply lines. Interestingly enough, increasingly inconsistent internet, which I think has moved across from being a very nice to have to being imperative for my personal use to really being almost a human rights issue in many of these places. And I think when I come to some of the cell phone stuff, I think we'll talk about that. And with it comes a lack of skilled staff who are not supported when they need to be. You often go into re to, to resource poor areas and particularly more rural areas and people are really cut off. And with it is a lack of creativity. And it's not because people are inherently are not creative, it's because of the fact they don't have 30 things to choose from, they've got two. And often they spend a lot of time getting things done that many of us in more resourced areas just take for granted. The other thing is that information systems are almost always universally poor. We still rely in, in most places on paper-based systems, and in, in certainly in the lower income, even at my hospital, you know, which is so-called center of excellence, we rely on paper-based. We still use carbon in certain places. I mean, it's that, that old-fashioned. And with it comes poor laboratory infrastructure, delivery of results, and, and finally poor referral systems. And then always for us, on top of the agenda is the issue that particularly in this region, that the majority of patients on treatment are women of childbearing age, that there's lots and lots of TB, there's lots of hepatitis B, and there are also lots of children. In certain other areas of the world, there's a lot of hepatitis C, which complicates things a lot. Um, but luckily for us, certainly in sub-Saharan Africa, the hepatitis C is actually relatively rare. So I have a friend in New York, I love putting up this case, who's been HIV positive for many, many, many years, who hasn't seen a doctor or a nurse in 10 years because he gets his... He gets an email with a barcode, and on that barcode is permission for him to go and get his laboratory. When his viral load's undetectable, his doctor sends him an automated email that says, I've authorized your meds, and they get delivered to his door. And it's incredible to think about that, about how, certainly within the American healthcare system, where they're trying to cut costs as much as possible, and those costs are often driven by healthcare access, um, how they've tried to automate it as much as humanly possible. And it's interesting to think how much of that could we do and we can. I mean, I get my dental appointments. I get my car. When my car needs to be serviced, I get all of this. I get a very similar package of care. It's only in health where we seem to have battled to kind of get this going. So some of my observations over the last 15 years of being involved is that some things didn't happen with the antiretroviral programs. The first thing that didn't happen is this mass community resistance. On the individual level, antiretroviral resistance is catastrophic for the individual. But when you look at it, we still, when you look at these various studies, looking at our various areas, there, 
community level HIV resistance is actually still relatively unusual. And there are certain classes which we slowly started to lose, like the NNRTIs, but I'm struck at how when we first designed these programs, this is what was front and center of our concern. And now we've got these new drugs and new approaches, which I'll touch on in just a moment. The other thing is that the percentage who are critically sick at presentation is dropping steadily across um, Africa. Um, if you look at the average CD4 count, it's going up, so less patients coming with crypto, less patients with pneumonia and TB, and that creates its own dynamic. It means that there's less burden on the sort of curative services and the hospital services. On the other hand, there's less impetus for patients to be adherent. And something that, you know, as the programs have matured over the last decade, um, is something we've got to take into account. One of the things we're seeing is patients re-entering the system. They fall off the system, they go off the antiretrovirals for six months, two years, and then they come back again. And that proportion of patients is actually getting bigger and bigger, and is a problem because a lot of the patients are very scared about coming back to get the antiretrovirals because the doctors and nurses will yell at them. We're always hearing about the health staffing crisis. I've become very, very skeptical about this. Um, South Africa is actually one of the countries with, which is not on the WHO kind of critical list of staffing, yet every single person I talk to, whether they live in Johannesburg or they live in Malawi or they live in London, is overburdened and over, you know, understaffed. And I do think that there's a lot of issues around staffing, which is about delegation of duties to the appropriate level of staff. And often it's actually people are undermanaged rather than understaffed. Um, and with it is that the fact that healthcare staff, particularly in Botswana, Namibia, South Africa, are very, very expensive and need to be utilized much more intelligently than they are at the moment. And they often come with vested interests. In South Africa, we've had huge problems rolling out certain services simply because um, certain categories of staff have insisted that the, the buck stops with them and nobody else should be able to do this. Dispensing medicines, doing HIV tests, and those kind of things. The other thing I think is that we appreciate is the viral load is increasingly more critical. And point-of-care viral load, to me, is one of those innovations which is, should have been here yesterday. We focused for way too long on point-of-care CD4 counts, which I think were always a bit of a waste of time. But the viral load is something, and still very few countries outside of South Africa and Botswana and Namibia have access to, to viral loads. One of the problems I have is that HIV people think theirs is the only disease on the block. And those of us who work in more general care will understand that there's malaria and there's diabetes and there's schizophrenia and there's everything else. But unfortunately, you'll find 80-page documents on HIV testing expecting your average primary health care nurse to somehow imbibe this. And I think it's something we really have got to get past is the fact that particularly where our patients are as healthy as they are in treatment, um, that we have to do something about that. So the good news is that programs are starting to improve. In South Africa, the average CD4 count, I know there was a publication that came out last year saying that the average CD4 count has stayed steady. I can't understand how that can be possible. But certainly in South Africa, we have good data that as the CD4 count threshold has gone up and as the HIV prog testing programs have gone better, uh, the proportion of patients testing with high CD4 counts has got steadily up. What's been amazing, and you've seen this in Botswana as well, is TBs coming down with the ARV rollouts. So for the first time, we have something that seems to be containing TB, and TB remains the number one killer in South Africa, Botswana, and Namibia. So it really is something that is desperately needed. Life expectancy has gone up. This is data from my own country, about a decade, just because antiretrovirals have been rolled out to young people. And I put this up because this is data from London, or from the UK, showing that people with average CD4 count of more than 350 who start on antiretrovirals in the UK are actually living longer than the general population. Now you might ask why the hell are you putting up UK data when we're here in Africa, but when you look at how quickly um, the countries are starting to get wealthy in this region, we might actually look more like the UK than we look like current African region going forward. And I think we need, you see this in Mexico and India as life expectancy has gone up dramatically. In Mexico it's only three years less than in America. And we need to start be looking at somebody who's 30, 40 years old is going to be looking at this rather than looking at the current life expectancy tables. So we all know about test and treat and offer. I'm not sure why this thing is flickering like this. Um, okay, just deal with it. Um, and everybody who hasn't had 1990-90 tattooed on them by now, I'm sure will have been by the end of this. The problem with 1990 is there's still problems, is the average CD4 count is still very, very low. We're getting to people very late. Um, and there's still a significant proportion of people, and that proportion in South Africa, certainly, where we, I have the data, has actually remained relatively stable. People testing below CD4 count of 100. And everybody in the audience knows that the village idiot can treat HIV with a CD4 count over 200. Below 100, you need to have toys. You need, you need CAT scans, you need specialists, you need special biopsies and things. You really are dealing with a different disease. And this is a massive problem for us, is how do we get these people who are late presenters? Who are they? Why are they coming in so late and trying to sort it out? 
Yeah, we know that there are massive groups not testing in there. And in fact, if you look at South African data, again, I'm sorry to quote it so often, but it's with the data I know. When you look at 1990, we've probably got most of the way there for women. For men, it's about 60, 60, 60. And they are missing. And then when you start dissecting that down, young men are particularly badly affected. And I'll show you a study that I hope will help us start addressing that. And one of the things, you'll hear a lot of stuff later on in this conference about who's infecting who, which age group is infecting who, and Slim Karim and the Africa Center have done some amazing modeling showing that it seems in that 20-year-old age group, men and women are infecting each other across the age groups, but within the age 20 bracket, which again suggests why in some countries like Botswana and others, while they're getting close to 1990, that the numbers of new infections isn't dropping as quickly as we would have hoped. And I wonder sometimes is maybe we're treating everyone in their 30s, which is when all the damage has already been done. We're saving the individual, but we're not arresting the transmission event. And this for us, for me, for the prevention folk, is one of our marching orders, is getting as many people in their 20s onto care as humanly possible. So what can we improve? We can get the cost down. We can get some resistance forgiveness. And you've heard about these amazing new classes of drugs. We can look at side effects. We can try and harmonize between pediatric and adult guidelines. This is unbelievably important, in certainly where we've got drug stockouts across our region. The PEDS cases have been the worst because they're separate. They're often not in the form of fixed dose combinations. Anybody who's not on a fixed dose combination gets, gets hurt, and particularly the low volumes and the pediatrics are always much lower volumes than the adults. We need to do some demand creation for those groups of people who are coming in late. We need to look at the size of the tablets and the packaging, and these new tablets and new drugs actually make that possible. And we need to look at our delivery systems, which I think we all know are antiquated and really, really unfriendly. And finally, we need more convenient HIV testing. I'm not going to focus on all of these, but there's a lot of stuff we still need to do. And this kind of end of age rhetoric, when we haven't fixed most of this, I think is just very, very premature. And I think that we need the kind of creativity we applied 10, 12 years ago to start an ALV program to go for the rest. So new drugs will help. And with all these amazing new drugs, you heard about Cobitegravir, you all probably sick to death of, user of listening to Dolutegravir. There's TAF, the Tenofovir Pro drug, and there's a whole lot of other stuff. There's science fiction -y nanoparticles um, and new classes, new antibodies and things. So it's a really, it's an embarrassment of riches within the HIV field. In fact, it's often difficult to work out where's the next priority because there's just so many to choose from. And you heard this amazing data, this preliminary, very enticing data about dual therapy and monotherapy at the last session and how that might change everything in the next five or 10 years. The problem is that it takes so long to get there. And part of the optimized consortium group I'm working with is to make this happen. If you look at Tenofovir from 2001, when it actually was registered by the FDA, it took a decade to get to South Africa's public health program, and then another two or three years before it was in a fixed dose combination. So we really need the progress when you find a wondrous new drug to actually getting it into the mouths of patients um, as in, a, in a quicker, more effective way. So WHO came out with several recommendations, many of you are aware of this, around 400 milligrams of efavirenz, around dolutegravir as being alternatives. The problem with both of those is that they haven't been tested in sufficiently in pregnant women, and we haven't sought out the TB drug interactions in both of those cases, both of which um, have issues. And the drug, the studies are ongoing, some of them I'm involved in, some of them I, I, I kind of have a lot of... I understand what's, where they are and stuff, and hopefully within the next two years, we'll certainly have sorted out the Favrin's 400 milligram issue. Now, you might be bored of me going on and on about South Africa. Now, the, the, the reason South Africa remains so important is just it's so damn big. It is huge compared to its neighbors. Every single, there's about six or seven other countries on bordering South Africa. South Africa's overall population, both its population and its HIV population, is bigger than all of those countries combined. And because of its, its size and its weight and its, its, um, and its wealth, it's able to do quite a lot. And you can see here that Nigeria, Kenya, Mozambique, Uganda, this is a UNAIDS graphic, are the next countries which are very, very important in terms of sheer size of the epidemic. So Kevin de Kock once said that if any of these countries fail, we fail. We can, we can get right in Rwanda, we can get right in Botswana, countries which have really taught us. But we have to get right in these other more problematic countries. So we've got about 67 million people positive. It's about one in five of the world's total. We consume um, about a quarter of the world's global generic manufacturing um, of antiretrovirals. We've got 3.4 million people on first line antiretrovirals. Lots and lots of people have children. 200,000 people on second line. Probably 50% of the continent's second line patients are actually in South Africa. And then about 700 on third line. So a lot, one of the biggest third line programs. So many, many people swallowing tablets. The problem with this is it costs 
a lot. And it's going to cost more because we all know tests and treaties coming. The countries who have embraced it, the ones who haven't embraced it yet, are going to eventually. South Africa has embraced it from September. Um, and we are now spending $350 million a year on antiretrovirals. That is a shed load of money. It doesn't matter where you live. And when you have other things like sanitation and jobs and roads and things like that, you know, with test and treat, the theoretically that will double. Um, at the moment, the South African government, PEPFAR and the Global Fund are the three biggest procurers of antiretroviral therapy in the world, so, which is an incredible thing to think and why often South Africa is the focus for many countries around drug discovery and the drug production because when we change our guidelines, the manufacturing industry sits up and takes notice. You know, Rwanda, which is amazing coverage, is very, very small for uh, a generic manufacturer to provide therapy to. So, and the final thing is that poorer countries, are, as we all know, is highly donor dependent. So money really is an issue to be taken into consideration. So we all know our first line regimens, tenofovir plus FTC or 3TC, whichever one you like. If Favarin's, if you fail that, you move into a protease inhibitor based regimen. Most people are on aluvia, uh, lopinavir. Um, and we'd just add some AZT, and then we'd combine these three drugs at the bottom. Dol Dolutegavir in South Africa is now going to replace Roltegavir third line. Um, and there are different algorithms for migrating. More and more countries are starting to provide third line therapy, at least seven or eight that I'm aware of at the moment. So, what about first line? So, good old tenofovir and efavirenz, it served us really well. It plays nicely in pregnancy, it plays nicely in TB. The problem is that tenofovir is the cost driver, it's somewhere between 40 and 60% of the cost of first line. And efavirenz is the weak link, plus it gives us all the side effects the rushes, the CNS toxicity, the gynecomastia. So, what we could do is swap their favorins for the 400 milligram. And that certainly would cut costs a little and would cost um, and maybe drop a few of the side effects. Um, but we need the pregnancy and, this, and the TB data for us to roll it out en masse. So in the short term, while we have efavirenz, which I think will stop soon, um, we are in a situation where efavirenz 400 milligrams is going to be the next thing we can do. What would be interesting, though, is to move to a new prodrug of um, called tenofovir alafenamide, which is a much lower dose than tenofovir. It uses the same chemicals, but its manufacturing process is slightly different, and it's, m it's probably at around 30% of the cost of tenofovir. So we have an option here, this drug, um, which we can optimize. We can replace tenofovir with, hopefully bring down the side effects slightly, and certainly bring down the cost. What's, you've heard all about dolutegravir and its amazing resistance profile. What's interesting is that scale, dolutegravir is slightly cheaper than efavirenz. So we would be able to replace efavirenz and still save money with a safer, much better drug that is cheaper. So that is quite something. And this is one of the studies I'll be working on is to try and get the information for WHO to hopefully change its, its guidelines to put this in first line. But you must remember we're going to be moving 15, 17 million people across to this regimen potentially. They need good data. And this is the kind of rant. You can see the blue line at the top is how much it's going to cost South Africa just to maintain its first line regimen going forward. If it tests, and this is without test and treat. And you can see the aggressive, the bottom line, the purple line, um, is when we move to antiretroviral therapy that's half the cost. And you can see we can treat the same number, of, we can treat twice as many people with the cost of what we're spending at the moment. So this is an amazing innovation if we can get it right. What about second line? Well, we all know that both the protease inhibitor and the AZT are both crummy drugs. They both have lots and lots of GIT toxicity and a whole range of metabolic problems. And I think everybody who's used these drugs is, you know, understands that they're a grudge purchase for people on second line. And the PI is very, very, very potent and, and certainly um, delivers all the resistance guardian that we need. What's interesting is could we perhaps, just going to the protease inhibitor, could we replace it with darinavir? Especially, I'm involved with a study looking at low-dose darinavir, a next-generation protease inhibitor that perhaps could replace it. The other drugs, NNRTIs with new NNRTIs with, uh, with um, high resistance barriers. And some people have wondered whether we could, um, we could use dolutegravir instead of the protease inhibitor or add the protease inhibitor to the dolutegravir. And there's several, several studies starting to look at this, really innovative stuff. Crazy Michelle sitting in the back there, thanks to Mark Weinberg's paper he published earlier this week, is even saying, why don't you take patients who are stable in a protease inhibitor and put them back on first line TAF and dolutegravir, which would be amazing, taking people on second line and moving them back to first line, you know, is, 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 a, is quite something. It'll be cheaper, it'll be a single tablet, it'll be amazing. So there's lots of optimization opportunities here, and you, you know, this is without looking at the injectables and all the other stuff that we were hearing about this morning. So here's another radical idea, which is completely different to the new drugs, and this is same-day initiation. This is a paper that was published in PLOS Medicine two months ago um, by Sidney Rosen's crew. And so why don't we do same-day initiation? 
You know, for most other drugs, you find somebody who's got um, something really wrong with them, and you usually will start them on some sort of treatment on the same day. Part of it's because we've had a CD4 count threshold. We didn't want to start somebody with a CD4 count of 600 on antiretrovirals unnecessarily. But now that's falling away. Also, we didn't have point of care CD4 counts. So the other thing is the creatinine clearance. We're all scared of turning patients into renal um, catastrophes. And the other thing we've done is we've really like, made this readiness thing. You know, honestly, it's like getting married or losing your virginity practically, starting your antiretrovirals. This incredible sense of like, momentous thing happening that, um, when you start your antiretrovirals. And I think we've created a bit of a drama around it that's unnecessary um, and scared patients, to be quite frank. You know, I'm always amazed when I watch my doctors and nurses telling people about starting TB therapy and antiretrovirals at the same time. They'll spend ages talking about the bad dreams around efavirenz, but they just whack them on TB therapy, which is far, far more toxic than antiretrovirals. Um, I think we've also, as I mentioned earlier, this historical perception of this frailty of any based regimens, that they somehow, you know, that you're going to break them so easily, and now we know that that's actually not as simple as we thought it was. It also, sadly, was also used as a mechanism to ration, in many cases, send people away, and if they really want it, they'll come back. And I also thought it was a bit like the old hypertension where you're just throwing tablets at people. So I preferred people to come back and to go through the counseling processes and all. So I was quite skeptical when the study was put forward. Um, but the problem with this is we know that people get lost. They come back two or three times, they just stop coming back. And in, you're all well aware of this, these cascades that everyone's talking about now. Andrew Hill has shown in beautiful detail, horrendous detail, that just between diagnosis, CD4 counts, and starting therapy, that we lose 50 to 70% of the patients. So when you send somebody out to the clinic, 50% of them are not going to come back on average, which is a horrendous loss to follow up and a horrendous impact on that. And we know then they come back with TB and crypto and all the rest. So this study, which was published, as I said, two months ago, and it's freely available in PLOS Medicine, essentially what they did is they took patients and they randomized them at two sites, at a hospital and, at a, and a, in a squatter camp at a primary health care clinic. Um, they didn't enroll pregnant women, which is important because pregnant women already go on to same-day initiation in South Africa. Um, and they, they said to them, would you like your ARVs? About 40% of these patients were actually diagnosed for the first time. The rest were either coming back for their CD4 count or were going to have a CD4 count done. They had a point of care CD4 count done. And then they randomized them. And here you can see that they used, it's quite a complex study. You need to go and read it quite carefully to, to wade through the thing. So, but what it demonstrates is the vast majority of patients were able to start, and most of the vast majority who were, were there for fast enrollment were able to start almost immediately. And what you can see here is that most of them were suppressed, and most of them were retained in therapy. And I, um, also what was interesting, and it wasn't brought out in the paper, is three patients died out of the 300. So you remember about 180 odds in each arm. Um, three patients died waiting for treatment. So that's quite a lot, and that's a fairly hard clinical marker um, um, in the one arm. And what's really interesting when you wade through this paper is that the benefit, interestingly, was not seen in women. So they, they showed far higher suppression rates, and they showed retention in care rates, but it was exactly the same whether they were delayed or start immediately if you were female or you're an older male. The benefits were all seen at both at the primary health care site and in young men, the one group who we're really, really, really battling to get in the region. So this really is something that may be benefiting young men, is to offer same-day initiation. Um, and here's the numbers, which unfortunately are a little bit... So you can see a 36% increase in antiretroviral initiations, which makes sense. And um, interestingly enough, a higher rate of virological suppression with a slightly higher loss to follow-up rate in the same-day initiation arm. So you get slightly loss to follow-up rates, but because of that huge drop-off in the second um, uh, to the next visit, you actually overall do much, much better. And for me, it's interesting, should we recommend this? Is, that, is it different from the private sector? Is it different in rural Malawi? Can you take central Johannesburg data and extrapolate it elsewhere? I'm not sure. Um, will it overwhelm services? And you know, raising the CD4 count threshold is not going to overload the services. This may well make the clinic much busier, much more fast in the short term. But I do think that if this was a tablet that improved virological suppression and retention as much as it did, we'd be marching in the streets for it. And it is, I think, certainly something we should be talking about going forward as something we could implement quite soon, not without complexity. So what about these M Health systems? And I, I confess that I am a very jaundiced one when it comes to M Health systems, having been burnt the hard way, and I'm sure many of you have. But to my mind, most of these technological solutions have been a complete waste of time and money. And believe me, I've managed to waste both um, trying to, to implement them. Telemedicine, I have yet to see a consistently successful model. I find sometimes a heroic doctor working in the back rooms, 
connecting with the local dermatologist on some system that doesn't work very well. And uh, you know, I think it goes through waves where everyone's like all enthused about telemedicine, but it really doesn't fit well with clinical care. Um, certainly not where I've, I've seen it being used. Cell phones are finally starting to show some success, but it's been 10 years of everyone telling me how amazing cell phones are and yet not really showing that much benefit. And what about e-records, electronic records? Everybody loves them until you have to deal with them. And believe me, when I go to the States and Europe and stuff, they have spent so much money trying to make these systems work, and they are starting to work. But I kind of want them to fix it and to come up to me with a ready-made problem before they, they bring it forward. And certainly in South Africa, we have been working, we have worked in other African countries. Everyone has their own e-record system, which is, um, which is being pushed out, and which, to my mind, has been consuming a lot of energy. What's the single most useful technological thing for healthcare workers? Throw it out there. I think it's WhatsApp. Because I get phone calls, I get photographs, I get like, like requests for information on WhatsApp about 20, 30 times a day. And it's really quite something when you think about probably the simplest technology is the one which has saved the most lives, not all that other stuff I was telling you about. And certainly we're starting to set up these rural WhatsApp support networks and things, and I think there's something in that is that, by the way, you can see at the bottom it says, yeah, he's such a pain, he's, <laughs> so yeah, I kind of cut off the real clinical advice that I was getting. But you kind of get these things all the time when you're a clinical doctor, and it's actually very quick. You can give advice in real time. The other thing that's been really useful in South Africa is having a centralized repository of blood tests where we can access them online, and that certainly has, helps with clinical care. What about cell phones? Well, about 85% of South Africans now have smartphones. Its penetration is lower in the rest of the African region, but you know, smartphones are, are the wave. I think the, the dumb phones are, are probably something going to be a thing of the past in 10 years' time. And it does make me think, like, why are we not providing free wireless at healthcare facilities as a way of getting people in to help give them information? Why, are we, why is it so difficult for us to make it the place that people want to come? And I can tell you, watch the people around here wandering around trying to find wireless. You know, there's no better way to get people to enter the healthcare system than it is to offer free wireless. The one of the things um, we have seen is the minister of yesterday launched a stock control app um, for cell phones, which nurses and pharmacists will be using, and I, had, I can't comment on it because I haven't seen it in action yet. We have apps that are helping in our MDR-TB program in South Africa, developed by the NHLS, really <coughs> impressive ones, which link um, healthcare um, workers to, to, to information, the different levels of it, and they give you these amazing reports that you can see here. Um, it's... Um, this is an app that we're working on that, that gives patients their blood results and which um, they have to, to log into on their phone and then you get your, kind of your CD4 count, your viral load and some advice that goes with it. It's been funny using this app though because every, we thought everyone would be dying to put it on their phone but I think people have got so many other apps they're like, yes doctor, whatever you say doctor. And um, the other thing is that we have less owners of smartphones than we were told. So we, that 85% I told you actually looked more like 60%. So one of the things about these these amazing technologies is make sure that you get your background data right. And finally, again, we battle to get young men to participate in the study that we did on this. We're getting there, but it has been a lot harder than we thought. So much, like much of the tech, it promises a lot, but it takes a lot of effort to actually get it out there. So let's, the last slide is what would happen if I had complete control of the health system in lower and middle income countries? What are the things I would prioritize and think about? Look, I think these simpler, safer drug regimens are going to be transformative. I think the debates we're having about resistance at this conference in 10 years' time are going to be completely different. And hopefully we'll have less drugs, we'll have cheaper drugs, we'll have safer drugs, more forgiving drugs. And the discussion we're going to have is adherence, not about, um, not about you know, which resistance mutation is, 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 is on the cards. So this stuff, I think, is on its way. I think it's worth giving same-day initiation a try. I think it's something that's easy to test. And even if all you do in your, your clinic is offer it to a patient and say, come back in a week and we'll get your creatinine clearance, then I think it's certainly something to think about looking at Sydney's data and thinking, could we make that work, particularly for young men? Point of care viral loads, I really is, particularly in busy clinics, I think, again, would be transformative and um, is a much more important um, immediate research priority than any of the other point of care tests, to my mind. So it's not often we ask the Americans for help, okay, and particularly when it comes to health systems because they have a shocking healthcare system, but they do know how to save money. And I do think that when it comes to some of the healthcare strategies for driving people so that, they, so that people stay out of healthcare facilities, we should be looking to them for some help. 
and these barcode systems, point of care pickup systems and things which people are playing with, many of the American systems have actually started to, to gain data on this, and I think we should be looking to them to, to hopefully gain some experience. And certainly that New York guy, that patient who picks up these medicines from the local clinic and doesn't go anywhere near a health facility, I don't understand why we can't do that. We have the technology, we just don't have the integrated systems to, to provide it. I really think that we have to get our information systems under control, and this is where I think African countries really need to be, get themselves together, is we need single patient identifiers, so we can link radiology data, clinical data, and laboratory data, because at the moment, it's all over the map. And the funny thing is, in the South African private system, we have this. We can know, we can pick up my HIV results off the private system, we know when I got my Prozac, they know when I got my antiretrovirals, they know anything about me. We can't do it in the public sector because we're not Put to, we just don't put it together enough. And I think that this needs to be a priority for health systems, is sorting out the single patient identifier. And lastly, I do wonder whether we couldn't integrate all these chronic diseases into one system. You know, the same thing for epilepsy, diabetes, and hypertension, possibly some of the other mental illness diseases. They all demand the same thing. They demand an algorithm approach to investigation and then for dispensing of the medicines. And then with it, some sort of intervention around, around adherence for the small proportion of people who actually need it, which is usually a social support issue rather than some arcane medical intervention. Thank you very much. Thanks.